10 nights, you make it the first of all, you don't blow thousands of dollars on the wrong gear. Most of us have got a toolbox at home with the fourth drawer full of about $5,000 worth of mistakes in navigation gear and communication gear. So what I'm trying to do here tonight is give you fundamentals about GPS navigation, which will help you basically work through problems of your own on a GPS. There's obviously a hundred different GPS units. There's a hundred different phone apps but there's some fundamentals that once you've learned them, you know where to go digging for the problems. Because to give you an idea, with navigation, it's never perfect, right? So you gotta, you gotta get used to the averages game. And what I mean that by that is, even when you're riding a track that has a very accurate GPX file, for example, if you're not making three nav errors in a day, it actually means you're looking at the GPS too much and you're probably going to hit a car. Right? So everyone's got to get used to the idea that you're going to miss a few turns and a few things are going to be wrong. So, you know, Usually you'll be paralleling a road on the GPS and you'll be going, but I'm on the track. Do I go out in that paddock? Do I go through that barbed wire gate? And the truth is, you'll learn that, for example, there are just some parts of Australia that the map set, which they originally put into the GPS, is 100 metres to the right. You know, that sort of thing. There's some anomalies in navigation that um, you just got to learn to deal with. But saying that, what I'm, the first test that with nav gear is obviously we have a situation where a lot of the bikes are getting better and better and they've got nav towers on them. Um, so for example, you've got a windscreen in front of you and you've got a perfect place to put a GPS or a tablet or a phone. But the truth of it is, is if you can't see it, no matter how good it looks, it's not gonna work, right? So most of you guys would be like me, You've got to have reading glasses, you've got sunglasses with prescription in it, you're just all day changing glasses. Now the truth of it is that the te first test you do with any nav gear is you put it on your handlebars and if that's where you can read it, don't worry about any form of mounting that's going to put it forward of there because you won't be able to see it, it'll be a blur, right? Now, so that's the first test that you do with any nav gear is, and it's, it's quite interesting, there are designs of bikes like the KDM 1290, I don't know, any of you got a KDM 1290? Right? Have you noticed how the fuel tank, like the, the whole bars and everything seems to be forward? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's Stretch all out. in front of you. So, for example, you've got to bring your nav gear close to, to read it. So, now, and what we're going through right now is basically the phone apps are getting to a point where they're going to replace GPSs. You know, the, the um, like we've got fantastic displays on GPSs, but the truth of it is, is they're $1,300 and most adventure riders go riding for seven days a year. So for example, the phone, is not a bad option for a lot of people because they're going to use it for the other 365 days a year. The other part of it is that with the phone navigation, you're actually missing a really awful step of finding a GPX file on the internet somewhere and you're going, I want to do that. Now I've got to learn how to stick that file onto a computer, then I've got to learn how to get it on the computer into the GPS. And that's where a lot of, a lot of issues occur. Now, so we'll just go through this. The GPS units, please, just buy Garmin. They're a proven unit. HEMA are a great map set, but the truth of it is, is they've never come up with a robust, waterproof, dustproof case that will survive on the front of a motorbike. And the moment you put it inside a case with a plastic thing on the front, you can't see it. So 
You know, even for example, um, with the phones, I don't put screen protectors on them because in direct sunlight, they affect how I can see it. So at the end of the day, I'm just gonna get a scrap phone, but I'd rather do that than not be able to see it. The tablets, um, very good. You know, the hardest part with the tablet though is finding a RAM mount to mount it. And basically, the golden rule of phones and tablets <coughs> is the moment you try and power that thing more than about 20 days a year using a micro USB going into the unit, the vibration will actually wear out the inner port of the unit and next thing you've got to throw it in the bin because you can't get power to it anymore. So those of you who own the old GPS units, the 62Cs and you know, the little Garmin's that had the micro USB port coming into the back, a lot of us love those units, they are bulletproof, but the truth of it is, is as soon as we couldn't get power enough because the vibration had worn out the inner port, we were bugging. So they're still good units to have though with a few batteries in the back. Um, so I'll just keep going here. Oh. Yeah, see it, but... yeah. So, now the other thing <coughs> that we've got to work on with any GPS that you're purchasing, any tablet, any phone, what you've got to work out straight away is how do I make this thing the brightest I can make it? And how do I make this thing so the power doesn't turn off or it doesn't go into sleep mode. So with the phone, obviously you've got to go into display settings and go, when do I turn off? And you go, never. You know what I mean? How do I get this on full brightness in daylight? And you just keep pressing buttons till the damn thing is glowing like a fluoro light. Now, the same with any GPS unit. If you don't have power going to it, the backlight will not work. Now, just a tip for those of you who've got Garmin's and whatnot. If, for example, um, you're in a situation where the GPS isn't getting power to it, you've got about a couple of hours to get to where you've got to be before the GPS will run out of gas. Um, at that point in time, you might want to turn down the brightness and whatnot to preserve your battery. Now, um, the units that we've got, they've got to have, they've got to be waterproof, they've got to be dustproof. Now. So in, in simple terms, if you own an adventure bike, the Garmin Montana, the Garmin Zumo units are the ones you buy. Um, and then after that, you're looking at phone units from here on. You know what I mean? So. Now, tracks compared to routes, this is, probably the most important stuff I'll tell you tonight, right? So, when we're dealing with off-road tracks, the best tracks are where someone has ridden before you and then handed you a GPX file. Now picture this, that track could be 10 metres off a road, right? What you've got to do is know how to set your GPS up that it will always put you on that track in an off-road environment, right? Now, what is the most common thing where people get into trouble is basically they'll, the GPS will ask them, do you want to convert this track into a route? Now with the Zumo 590s and the Zumo 390s, which were a previous generation of GPS, they automatically ask you that, and because people were so desperate to get a think, thicker pink line, because they couldn't actually see the track on that GPS because it had a software issue where the track it made one millimetre wide, you'd go, damn, yeah, yeah, turn it into a route, I want to see a big purple arrow. The moment you do that, you're heading down the M1. You know what I mean? It's taking you the fastest direction. So when I'm working with the GPS, Basically, I'm only ever switching between two different modes. And that is, when I'm setting up for an off-road ride, I'm basically 
wanting to just use a track file and to give you an idea of the definition of a track file pick this map here a track file is simply overlaying a track onto a map if you make that track more than 10,000 dots and the way you see that is if you go into the track file and you look at properties if it's got more than 10,000 of these 90% of the GPS's will have a spasm when they're loading, right? So one of the things is, is, is learn to do this stuff. Basically, the track should never be longer than one day's riding. That's where it usually works out to be less than 10,000 track miles. Now, what happens is, when we're in tracks, we're simply following the purple line, and when we see a black line where we've been, leave it, we know we're stuffed up, right? So there's nothing, there's no automation navigation going on within that unit. So your car unit, it works on auto calculation. It has a map and it is trying to work out the quickest route. Now, if you leave that inside a GPS that you're trying to go on an off-road ride, you bug it. It will leave the track that you've been trying to follow and the worst bit is you can actually go for rides and it'll work fine because the person who gave you the GPX file never leaves the road, right? Or you could get lucky that the map set was good enough that it had a, a track underneath it so it worked the whole time. And then the next ride you go out, you bug it. Right now, and see what happens is on a lot of the modern GPSs, they'll have a spasm and the screen will freeze because it's trying to take you back to the closest road the entire time. And next thing, your GPS has got lag, and you're going, "What the hell's going on here?" So that is why we always deal in tracks, right? Yeah, mate. <clears throat> Are there any questions on that point at all? Or has everyone learnt that the hard way? <laughs> right. Now, if you've got a Garmin GPS, you've just gone out and bought it, or you've bought a second hand or whatever else, there's two, two software programs you've got to get your head around. The first one is Garmin Express. Garmin Express updates the software on the GPS. Now, especially if you own a Garmin Zumo 390 or 590, which had that problem with the small track line, get straight onto Garmin Express, do an update, because they've actually got an update to make the line thicker. Okay, so, but you always, before, you know, before you're doing your, once a year you do the Garmin Express where you update your software on your thing. It doesn't need doing more than once a year, you know what I mean? And do I pick the updates are up which are for the Belgium map? No, you know what I mean? Which, um, you know, pretty much that's all you've got to remember. Now, Garmin Basecamp, now that's your bridge between you finding a GPX file on the internet somewhere in Trans um, Australia Trails and being able to put it on your GPS. So Garmin Basecamp is Garmin's program that allows you to do that. So you just basically Google Garmin Basecamp download and then you put that onto a laptop. <laughs> Around the beer. Popular man, boy. I've got no chance to teach you how to use GPS. You can't do the phone now. So, here's the thing the problems, say, if you've come on one of my rides, basically what I'm trying to do here is avoid that issue of you turning up and next thing me not being able to load your GPS because 
you know, the, the heat is on, we're all heading out. So learning how to load a track on is important. So what happens is, now a common thing with GPSs, where a lot of guys lose it and get frustrated, when they plug the GPS into the computer, it's a matter of go and have a coffee. Because sometimes, the more modern the GPS it seems, the more trouble the computer has finding it. And then you go, well this, this cord's not working or whatever else. And it takes up to three or four minutes and next thing it will come up with the folder going, I've just found a Garmin Zumo, blah, 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 right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know the other the other part of it is too is those leads wear out, and next thing your computer can't find your GPS. So then you just you've got to go get another data cable because it's a common problem where they just don't talk to each other anymore. One of the reasons we're heading towards phone apps is because none of this matters anymore. Okay. Now, I'm just going through this. So, buying a GPS. So what happens is we're all, we're all trying to, when you go to buy one of these things, you're getting bloody hell, $1,100. And then you see one over here for $900. And you go, I'm onto that, right? The thing is, is if it doesn't have an Aussie topo map, you may as well use it as a boat anchor in Morton Bay, right? Because you need to have a map set that is the go. Now, when you buy this GPS, both of these are pretty, you know, they're high-end GPSs. And, you know, they come, when you buy them, if you go through a mob called GPS Oz, I've spoken to Brian, and we've basically designed the mounting kits and the hard wiring kits, and he calls it a motorcycle kit, and it's what you need if you're gonna run that on your motorbike, right? So, it'll have a hard wiring kit, and a ram mount, as well as the Oz map, Oz topo map. And those two units come standard with what's called City Navigator, which is the map set, which allows you to type in the Birdsville Hotel, and then it'll navigate it, navigate to it. The Oz Topo doesn't do that. It's laying the best map that we can find, like a sheet, inside your GPS. Okay? So, now, with these units here, say, for example, you're going to Europe, and you think, well, okay, I'm, I'll just, um, I'll take my GPS because I'll use it in the hire car or you're lucky enough to be going riding there. It's really worth getting the city navigator for whatever country you're going to. They're 140 bucks for the whole of Europe, 140 bucks for the whole of North America. When we went to Canada, I was trying to navigate eight lane highways using a GPX file where I just had a thin purple line. And once I had sort of four lanes and I had to pick the right one, I was bugger. Whereas my mate who had the city navigator for Canada, his had a purple arrow go and take the second lane. I'm thinking, I need that. So that is, you gotta spend the money when you get it. And the thing is, is without the Oz Topo, it just is bugger. It doesn't work, you know? And that's the same with the Gaia um, phone app. The reason I'm telling people to get premium is because it has one to 100,000 top A maps for the whole of Australia. And pretty much you can download 100 of those maps into your phone in one hit. And that's pretty much the whole of South East Queensland, for example. And then that GPS will work when there's no phone signal because you've got a map set with all the detail you can imagine, sitting in the phone, it's memory. That's why I don't need to talk to, you know, the phone towers. Um, so that's just an explanation on that. Any questions on that, guys?
Um, if you're riding on the road 80% of the time and 20% you're going on off-road stuff, I'd buy a Zumo. Um, the reason being is it's got some cool stuff where it gives you riding instructions through your centre headset and a few other things like that, whereas the Montana um, is not as orientated towards that. The Montana is, if you're doing 70% of your ridings in the bush, I'd buy a Montana. You know what I mean? Now the Montana unit, um, like, they are becoming more and more advanced, which it's not that much fun for us. So what I'm suggesting is if we're like, a lot of us have had these Garmin Montanas on our bars now for 10 years. If you see one of those pop up on the internet, a 650 or a 680 or a 610, and it's three or 400 bucks, buy it. Because we've had none break. <coughs> and when I have had one break, because I ran over it myself, um, I sent it in to be fixed and they just sent me a new one. So it's a pretty good after sale service. So now, Going through this, how many of you use garments, Montanas, and that sort of stuff? And um, I'll just sort of go through now, um, like, to put a file on that GPS, right? This is pretty important if you've not been able to work through this. When you actually, the more modern the GPS, the more you don't use find the unit or whatever, you know in Basecamp where it's got find the unit or select the GPS. Don't worry about that, because what we've worked out is if you've got a GPX file that you've got from somewhere and you've got from the Facebook page of APC Rallies events, if you grab the whole file, and just put it into that Garmin folder on your computer and you go into the GPX file. So it starts at Garmin, then it goes um, Garmin folder, then it goes and you select GPX file. If you stick it in there, it'll instantly go in. Boom. You know, like 10 days of riding goes in about two seconds. Now, especially the, the new units, that works best. For some reason, that you know, using the old find the unit sort of thing in base camp doesn't work that well. Okay. Now, once the GPS, once the file is in the GPX file of the computer, I might just bring this up for a second if I can. So. This is important. So, when we connect the GPS, I'll just show an example of how long it takes. So, the GPS lights up and then it's thinking, right? to the folders down here and now I'm going to wait till the GPS shows up on the PC. So that's the noise you want, right? But as you can see, a whole lot of people have already hopped off the bus going, this is bullshit, this is done work, it cost me 1300 bucks. You know what I mean? So you've got to let it up to it. So okay, up it's come. We want to go into Garmin. Actually, I'm going to go over here. So, 
can you see how the Garmin Montana file? I'm sorry for those guys that are a bit further away. And then you go into GPX. This is where all the action is. Now, <clears throat> say for example, I rode a smashing track that day and I want to, I want to make sure I put that away somewhere safe. I'll go into current and then I can name that track. Now, part of working with the GPS is when you buy them, their default thing is they record GPX files in one massive folder, right? And that's a nightmare because the way you remember rides is you go, listen, I remember we went on a Kraken ride last Easter. So next thing you go looking at the days that you rode in April and that's how you find it. So when we are looking in the GPS's, um, when we're actually setting it up, we make it that it records track daily. And I'll show you where that is a bit later. So that's in your settings. So for example, it, it'll say, do you want to um, record track when full, daily, and you say daily, right? So now, um, I'll just click on that, and it's opening Basecamp now. So what happens is, Basecamp is my default so as soon as any GPS file is sent to me, or GPX file, it goes into Basecamp automatically and it opens it up. So, yeah, I, you can see I do a little bit of riding. So, basically, you know, all of the GPS files that I've got are stored in there. That's just because there's no file in there. So, the big files for the easier ones. track that I'm doing for the next ride and you know that's that's how I lay it out so day one 330 kilometers day two 410 day three 446 day four four 108 now what I'll what I'll show you like I know I've sort of moved around a bit but I'm sure a bit of this is clicking with a few of you that have had nights of frustration right because if you play in the wrong places, this gets hard. <laughs> so, to give you an idea, what um, I've done is I've opened up the properties there. So remember how I was talking about how if you have more than 10,000 points in a track file, it's buggered. This one's only got 5,075. Now, it's in purple, and that's pretty much all I need to know. So what it does is it highlights the track that we're doing, right? And then if I'm, I've got day two, and there's that one. So that's ending at Dorigo there. Now, if you are sort of, you know, designing your own tracks or riding these tracks, Try and make it that you never go back on yourself. So if I go into town one way, I want to head out of town the other way. The reason being is, if I've got two people GPS navigating, bike on bike action is not good. You know what I mean? Adam Ryman hit a guy at the KDM rally because they went back, they had a fuel stop down the road, right? So they had to go down to the fuel stop and then come back. You know what I mean? 
200 riders, it's not where you want to be. So if you're doing this, you've got to sort of always think, like to give you an idea, when I used to race safaris and that sort of stuff, the guys who were special could navigate as fast as they could ride. That's Andy Caldercott, you know what I mean? Ben Graben was just as fast, but he was actually, Ben was riding at 70% of the pace he could and still winning and still navigating perfectly because it was like he was standing still, you know what I mean? So navigation is a funny thing in the fact that a rider can be a bit of a gummy, but they could actually be a, a gun navigator. Now, what happens is for a lot of you, the like the map book is what you need to look at in the morning. Um, this map book here. So what I suggest to all of you is if you can get access to a photocopier or you just mark your own map book up, you know what I mean? I sit there with a purple line because it's quite interesting. I have people say to me, John, do you know that such and such track? Do you know that such and such road, that intersection? I go, mate, I don't know enough. When I'm out looking at track, I'm living on the purple line. You know what I mean? I have no idea where I am. <laughs> exactly, pretty much. So, but what I'm suggesting is, is I'm using the map book to, first of all, create my tracks, because what will happen is, I can create a track where I'm just targeting known riding areas. So for example, if I'm going down towards Sydney, uh, hello, Coffs Harbour is the home of Little Bike Country. So, you know what I mean? I'll just look for state forests heading into Coffs Harbour, and then I'll look on my map set, and then I'll pick the track that's going through, and then I'll mark it on here and create a track. And then when I get there, what'll happen is the best navigation you can have, or the most fun you can have is if you know there's a purple line, and for example, from Barrowville to Dorigo, it's 130 kilometers. You know that because you put it together. Then what happens is when you see little minor tracks heading off, and you see, you know, like little bike tracks on the dirt, you go, oh, I'm onto this. And the reason you can go and have a crack at it is because you've got a purple line that you can always horseshoe back onto. You know what I mean? Like, so that whole idea of it is, is a good track starts with a map and Woodsy, you know, he can't be here tonight, but Woodsy and I did tens of thousands of kilometers together, right? And he's an old cotton farmer and he'd be there with the map and he's probably the reason a lot of you are still alive because basically you go, John, we gotta go get fuel. Because I'm just living, I'm just looking for track, you know what I mean? I'm just there looking on the ground, looking at my GPS, just trying to go. And that's what a few of you have done the APC rallies would have gone, how the hell did they find this spot? You know what I mean? It's like culverts under railway lines and whatnot. It's because we follow tracks, you know what I mean? And, um, but that's, it all, there's never a place where these map sets or these map books shouldn't be in play. And you've got to have one in your, on you because half the fun of it is, for example, I've gone for rides um, where I'm heading down, um, I'm heading basically down towards Sydney and next thing it looks like it's going to rain for four days. So what will happen is I'll just sit in the pub with my map book and create another track you know, adjusting to the weather because obviously I don't want to ride in the rain for four days. And so that's where um, this little map <laughs> um, That, for example, cost $400 10 years ago, I think it cost $300 now. It's got the one thing that I can't get on an Apple iPad and that's a USB port that I can plug a GPS into. So, you know, that's been in the motorbike for a lot of kilometres and still going. And all I've got in there is a couple of different cords that attach to everyone's GPSs. 
And it's funny, actually, the older the laptop I've got, the more GPSs it talks to, because the more, you know, they're generating, the more they don't like each other. So, I'll just keep going there. Hey, John, any any questions? I, yeah, can I ask, what, is, it the, is the paper copy your personal preference? Because you yeah. can do the same thing on your iPad or something, couldn't you, with the topographic maps? Yeah, I like, listen, what I do is, I'm looking at the paper map next to the computer as I'm doing it because I'm looking for, you know, the, the HEMA map set has a really good base of public roads. So they've got a colour of public road, like pretty much if it's on the HEMA map book, we can have a crack at it. When I'm, you know, the, the golden rule of public roads is they've got reflective posts on them. If you don't see reflective posts and you've gone through a gate, you've got to start asking a few questions. You know what I mean? But a lot of APC rally tracks go through a lot of gates because, you know, we've, we've done the homework and whatnot. And the truth of it is, is when you're out there with your mates and there's only three or four of you, punching through a gate and having a crap at getting somewhere is a lot different to me taking 180 rides. You know what I mean? When I'm doing it, I've got to play a conservative game, you know, because we don't want to, we don't want to piss the person off. And that's the other thing about these track files sitting on these websites. Don't be an idiot if a property owner pulls you up and goes, you boys shouldn't be in your game with the old chestnut, but mate, I've got this track file off the internet. Expect to hear the lever action of the rifle. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're, you know I mean, at the end of the day, use your own, if you see private road, no trespassing, blah, 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 if you've downloaded that track off the internet, don't go through. You know what I mean? Don't go through. It makes it hard when people actually do put private um, roads on roads that are gazetted roads, and you know what I mean? It, make, it makes it a bit hard, but anyway. So, any questions about that stuff? No? No? So, um, Now, the, the Garmin GPSs and the phone apps all are a little computer, right? And if you know from yourself, if you run five or six programs at once on any computer, it slows right down. So, on the Garmin Montanas and the earlier GPS units, if you're running Oztopo, that's the only map set you run. You turn every other map set off because otherwise your unit will glitch, right? If, for example, you, you're you riding a classic track, one of the blokes bins it, and you need to know where's the closest town, you then quickly get into your GPS and you go to the routing section and you go from direct routing to automobile fastest time, right? That is what you have to do. They're the only buttons you actually need to know how to play with your GPS. You know what I mean? Because it comes down to a point that when you're using the bike to go somewhere, you just use the auto navigation. When you actually are following a track file, you've got to remember that, for example, on the GPS like this one, we're using direct routing. Unfortunately, on the 750Is, the newest one, they're different settings. So what we're doing is, one by one, we're putting YouTube videos up on the Facebook event page, going through the settings that we know worked at the last ride for different units. So there's, but in, you know, up until GPS is made for the last year, it was always direct routing. So what we were doing, we were turning off all the automatic stuff. So, okay. so, and all the avoidances and whatnot, we turn them all off because we're not, it was gonna glitch the unit, okay? So there's a couple of important points there. You go into the GPS, you, you look at your maps and your map settings, and you go, what maps are currently operating and if you go, okay, I'm doing a GPX file ride, 
I'm just turning everything off. I know how to get to the survey. So you lay it in the track, you put it on direct routing or whatever settings we've put in the videos and you're good. You know what I mean? Then you're right. Okay, so that that's the biggie. But obviously, for example, another one is, you know, if you're following a GPX file, the number one rule is you've had a look on the internet first to see where the fuel is, right? That's that's a key one. So um, you not you got to know where your fuel is. And now, if for example someone hasn't fueled up, and by the way, we got a saying from years and years of adventure riding, and that is, I'd rather be looking at fuel than for it. So even if we have just put fueled up. If, it's, if, if we've done more than 50 k's, we're fueling up again, you know what I mean? So we leave every fuel station we see full of fuel, full of water, you know what I mean? And that has served us very well because obviously Stanthorpe Ride, there was a bog hole, track diversion. There was a river up, track diversion. If we were out in back country, that could have been 200 kilometres of track diversion, you know what I mean? So, if you're taking people riding with you, don't, especially the young ones, you just go, did you fuel up, mate? And they go, no, 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 I just fueled up five minutes ago. I go, mate, please fuel up. Please fuel up because we don't know what could happen in the next section. You know what I mean? So, now. Now, for the Gaia GPS stuff. Now, pretty much, I might have this wrong, but I actually think within two years, none of us will be buying GPSs anymore. Um, the reason being is a six and a half inch smartphone from Officeworks is $160, right? Um, basically, the Charging, has anyone got that cradle that I had? So these are coming onto the market. Um, for example, this is called Q-mount. So for example, the reason I'm trialing this is obviously any smartphone, even in its case, can go in there and then um, it locks onto it. And then it's if it's got modern charging, surface area charging, it'll charge just being against that. And then as a backup, it's got a USB port here. So you just buy a one inch power cord because obviously, you know, most of us would be lucky to do 20 days bush riding a year on our bikes. So having a USB cable going into that phone for 20 days is not gonna hurt it. You know what I mean? Leaving it in there and riding all the time to and from work and whatnot that port in that phone will eventually be rooted and it won't power anymore. So that's why, you know, first of all, phones need power consistently to work. And the other part of it is, is um, you actually don't want to flush mount it against too much because they actually get hot. So when they're getting power to them all the time, another thing is, is if you're running a navigation app, pretty much every other app on the phone needs to be off. Otherwise, the extra heat will cause issues, you know what I mean? And um, that's that's sort of the new era now. As we go into the, the Gaia stuff, um, what I would, am suggesting to you is there's two reasons why most of you should get this, even if you've got a thousand dollar GPS on the bars, Having that backup system is a no-brainer for $56 a year subscription. That's just money well worth it. Now, the fact is, the reason I say get that subscription, because there is free options. But the truth is, is the subscription allows you to get that one is to 100,000 Topo Maps download. So you can download them onto the phone. So if, for example, you don't have phone reception, that GPS is still working, right? 
So you plan out the track that you're going to do or the area you're going to be. So say you go to the high country, you can download the whole of the high country into that bush phone. We'll call that a bush phone, that secondary phone, um, or a tablet or your own phone if you want to do that. And it'll work well. The other part of what we like about the phones is you don't need to learn any of this computer stuff because the track file has come we're learning how to actually put the files into Gaia and share them. So what happens is on the Stanthorpe ride, right, did any of you download the track file straight from Gaia onto your phone? Yeah? And it was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. And then obviously, um, you know, that's the future where we're staying in the one system. You know what I mean? We, we basically share them. And, now, the, the other reason you want to look at the Gaia stuff is because how many of you have tried to use Basecamp to try and put a track together? It is the worst program ever invented, and I use MapSource, basically. There's one guy on the internet who, it took me ages to find one guy who actually explained it perfectly. It's, it's just, give you an idea, in 20 minutes on Gaia, I basically created 300 kilometres of track manually, which is, that's, you know, that's the that's the good stuff. When you haven't been somewhere and you're going, okay, I'm going to have a stab at this, you know what I mean? And the, the best thing about the Gaia stuff is how many of you have been in base camp and gone, oh, I'll select the Google you know, Google satellite images. And next thing it freezes up, it doesn't work, it's bugging, right? With the Gaia app, you can be switching from satellite to the map instantly. So basically, I'm putting a track on a road, I quickly go on a satellite, I check that the road's dirt, I go, yeah, that's in, and up I go, right? Now, the other thing about the Gaia app is if you've ever created a track manually in um, base camp or map source, you've got to mark a point on every corner trying to do this, right? With the guy one, you put one mark at the start of the track, one mark 20 k's down the road, and it just curls around and creates a track. Boom, done. Then you're looking on the next one. But that's not that's not really even the best part. Did you do that on your phone? No, no I always do the mapping on the, on the desktop. Now, so GPS work, because all of us are working and getting to go riding is, you know, we're on such limited time, it doesn't want to be the day you're trying to learn how to nap, right? This Gaia system, if you've got Apple Play in your car, how many, put your hands up, you've got Apple Play? Okay, so you attach your phone, You've got the Gaia app going, and next thing you're switching between topo maps and satellite images, <laughs> looking on your screen on your, in your four-wheel drive going, well, this is pretty cool. And now you're playing in the same navigation system as what you do on your motorbike, and you've got it in your car, you know what I mean? So now, so that, that's a biggie for me, because especially if you're running a support vehicle for a trip, now, the reason, the other part about Gaia is all of our past, all of the, you know, the magic track files from the last 15 years are all GPX files. The Gaia stuff instantly talks to it. It produces a GPX file. HEMA and Google are what's called a KML file. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to convert a KML file to a GPX file, but it, I reckon I could send a man to the moon easier. You know what I mean? And sure enough, there's programs that have made it easier, but the truth is too, is that's when the track's 100 metres to the left because they're different map sets, right? And it's just incredible, like in a place, Woodenbong, for example, is a place where the whole of the map set has moved 100 metres to the right. So the whole time you're navigating, you're just paralleling the track, okay? Um, okay. 
So guys, I know that's pretty hard to see. So when we're in Gaia, basically that is what a track, and for those of you who ride enduro, that, that's a little bike track around Peachester. So I just wanted to see what it looked like, right? So what happens here is I can see that it was 62.7 kilometres. Um, I can see what heights it are, I never worry about that. But anyway, if I want that track, I can basically go over here and download it and put it in my phone straight away. So but that's not good enough reason to get it. In Gaia, this is, this is the bit that is the point of difference. Over here in map overlays, and it only works on desktop, it doesn't work on your phone, right? If you go to public tracks, pretty much anywhere where there's good riding in Australia or good four-wheel driving, Gaia hasn't been out that long, but let, look, at, look at that map, that's um, Kenilworth. So it's just like a sea of spaghetti. Any area that's a known riding area is a sea of spaghetti. And what happens is, what I've learned to do, was I'm worried about, I don't want to, there's mountain bike tracks, there's walking tracks, there's four-wheel drive tracks. So what I'll do is I'll go to the main intersection, I'll go to the mango tree or somewhere, or I know where all the riding starts at, you know, somewhere like Peaches. And you go to that intersection, you just put the cursor on a track, and then it'll bring up that track on the map, and then you move the you move the cursor over to a different coloured track and then it brings up 130 kilometres of someone else's track. And then I'll go, well, they're, they're, they look like they'll be motorbike tracks or four-wheel drive tracks because they are at that main intersection. And then what I'll do is I'll go, I'll get that one, that one, that one, and that one. And I'll download them and I'll put four different tracks on my phone, right? And then what will happen is, if I've got it wrong, and I'm heading up a mountain bike track, I'll just click into another one. And then I'll ride that when I'm there. Now the other part of it is, is when you're building track manually, you can basically just get the one that is going to the town the most direct fashion. You know what I mean? Like you're looking at it and you're going, that one takes me into town. So I'll give that one a chance. Or, for example, you can easily cut and create a track. Now, you know, this is a lot like, so what happens is, say for example, you're riding tracks and you don't want them to be public, you've got to learn the setting which says, don't make this track public, right? But obviously, not a lot of people press that. And this is sort of, to give you sort of insight, You know, it just keeps going. That, for example, see this here. It's listed all the tracks that are in there. So I just click that, download it. It's straight in the phone. I'm done. I'm not again. So what's going to happen as this gets older, this program? There'll be guys that do hard enduro, and they'll go hard enduro track. Do not enter. I'll be <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And they'll be like adventure bike ride, blah blah blah. Because you know our our free rides that I'm doing, which I know the whole idea of the free rides is I know mates that are, you know they're retired, their wives have died and whatnot. And the whole idea is they can just hook up on a certain day midweek with four or five mates and go and ride this track. Now the truth of it is is it doesn't get any better than that when you don't have to worry about where you're going on a ride. You know what I mean? And the thing is also, is say there was a problem and they got phone reception, you know, pretty much not only like, like there are going to be other people that know where they are. You know what I mean? So the, the thing that I'm trying to stress to people is these free tracks that we put on the ADB events page, there's only one rule. Don't go and do them by yourself because they're minor tracks. 
I'm good at finding tracks. I'm good at finding tracks no other people go on. So that means if you crash, you ain't gonna get found until another rider is coming through. There is no four wheel drive cover, right? So that's just the one rule you gotta remember. And I know that, listen, I probably can't be the one that talks about riding by themselves because obviously I've done a bit of it. Um, but I'm carrying a spot tracker. I'm riding at 70% of the speed that I can. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of, but even then I have moments. You know what I mean, like everyone has moments. And it act, seems to actually happen when you're not on the gas because you're actually dropping concentration. So, are there any questions on that? Yeah. Just one with the guys that will know, if anything you plot on your computer and save it as a group or whatever, yeah, it's will compare good. immediately across to your phone, they sync? No, it's, well, yeah, so it does. Good, yeah. it's a good point. Yeah, if you um, the app that they sync. Yeah, so, so when you buy Gaia, and you get the $59 thing and you put in your email address and your password, what happens then is, say you bought a $130 tablet, you put in your email address and your password and the guy app, and bang, that's your world on that tablet. It's all automatically synced from the cloud, right? So there's no more, oh, I've got that sitting on my computer, I've got that sitting on my GPS, it's all just in there. You know what I mean? You don't have to manually put it across. No, no. And you can buy it, right, online, like on Gaia's mm. website, instead of on your app, you get a discount. Yeah. So I did that stuff to me. Like yeah, yeah. So if you get a tablet, you still have to download the base maps. Yeah. And then it's in the settings, it's called the integrity check. By the way, Chris is about so a year just, ahead of me on Gaia. You just do your yeah. integrity check. <laughs> I always do integrity check every time before I go out. Chris, do you want to come up and do a bit on Gaia? Uh, I don't know, what do you want to do? Oh, just, just on what, like, you're a year ahead of me. You know what I mean? Like, what's that? You mentioned $59 or something? Yeah. When I had a look at it this afternoon, it came up $99 and that was US. 